Hello, everyone. We are post-Easter, post-initiation, and therefore in our CIA, have entered into phase four, mystagogia, a wonderful word that talks about an invitation by God to continue to grow and learn the deeper mysteries of God's presence. This is what we call the journey of spirituality. Our infinite God offers us infinite opportunities to grow closer, to draw ourselves into a greater meaning in life. But again, it's totally up to us. While God is always pursuing and inviting us, God never forces spirituality on anyone. This mystagogia we're talking about is really a deeper walk into the reality of the Christ, the Christ who has come to us in the sacraments. The ultimate question then is, how on fire are we going to be about our faith? Will we be forever drawn toward the blazing sun or will we withdraw and become lukewarm about it? This is the lifelong challenge of mystagogia. And everyone, not just those who have been in our CIA, has to face this phase of life sooner or later. I'm going to call this talk Spirituality for the Long Haul, because in my experience, what good is religion or spirituality if it cannot serve you in every phase of your life, no matter how young or old you are? We need to adopt a spirituality that is expansive, one that can continue to give us meaning and life, no matter how old we are. And so I'm going to be directing my comments then toward how we can develop this deeper spirituality of mystagogia. Today we hear this expression from many, many people, especially the young. Well, I am spiritual, but not religious. What does this really mean? It seems like people are a little confused about the connection between spirituality and religion. And many people today have the misconception that they're two separate things. I'm going to just say to you that they are connected, intimately connected, and yet they have two different functions. I'm going to be talking about these differences and similarities as we go along here. The word spirituality is a common one today, and yet definitions of it are diverse. To many, spirituality means someone who maybe likes to pray, talk about metaphysical issues, or might dabble in symbolic rituals. To others, they define it as someone who plays by a set of rules made by institutions based on scripture or tradition. Look at these two bullet points again. The first one, someone who likes to pray and talk about metaphysical issues, etc. That's what most of the time we refer to as spiritual. It's general. It has no rules about it. The second bullet point about someone who plays by a set of rules made by institutions is more a definition of religious. And so we need for sure to begin by separating those two out. If I say I am spiritual but not religious, it means I like being in touch with God but I want to define what that means. I don't want institutions to define it for me. 
Let's ponder for a moment this definition. We are not human beings struggling to be spiritual. We are spiritual beings struggling to be human. This is a quote by the Jesuit Tehar de Chardin. If you haven't heard of him, go Google him. You'll be pleasantly surprised and intrigued. Anyway, struggling to be human is really the ultimate challenge for all of us. Because as Tehard says, we are spiritual. That is our nature. How do we know this? We know it because restlessness lies at the heart of every human being. We are forever driven by it. In other words, we are never satisfied with just the material things of this world. Think about it. You might have wanted a really flashy, beautiful car, and you thought that when you got it, you were going to be happy for the rest of your life. Well, you got the car, and a year later, you want something else. The same thing happens in relationships. We find the ideal mate, but a few years later, we're disenchanted by that relationship and we're looking for another. The same thing happens with work, with other situations in our life. We are never satisfied with anything that this world can provide for us. And we have this fire inside of us to keep looking, to keep searching, to finally find something that will satisfy us. That fire is in every single person. We're born with it. We're created by God to have it within us. But spirituality is about what we are going to do with that fire or that desire. Everyone, and I would say everything, is spiritual. That is the divine imprint. But again, it's up to us what we will do with that fire that has plant, been planted within us. We can use it for life-giving purposes, or we can use it to destroy life. That is the curse of individual freedom. That is also the blessing of it. For example, here are some pictures of all kinds of different people. And all of them have different types of spirituality. From Lady Gaga to the Dalai Lama to Donald Trump to Mother Teresa to Pope Francis to the leader of South Korea and J.K. Rawlings and others. All of them have a fire or a spirit within them, but how they express it, don't you agree, is very different. We ask ourselves when we think of spirituality and faith, what can we choose? What will uplift us and what will tear us down? According to Sister Joan Chittister, Spirituality is the way we express a living faith in the real world. And so even though spirituality may, might seem a little hidden <clears throat> or simply not definable, it is really brought to life in how we live. Authentic religion is driven by spirituality. Religion and spirituality then should never be separate from one another. Positive spirituality uplifts the human condition and is for transformation of the world, not for individual gain. Positive spirituality is altruistic. It focuses on the common good of other people. Positive spirituality gives meaning and purpose to life. 
It brings joy into the world. There are many, many different spiritualities expressed in our world. And here's just a few of the ones that I will point out to you. There's Christian spirituality, Hindu, Buddhist, Jew Jewish, Muslim. These are all religious spiritualities. But there are also Native American spiritualities, Celtic, desert, monastic, contemplative, charismatic. There's even a New Age spirituality, what I call the mindfulness movement. And did you know there's a spirituality called interspirituality, which combines religion and some of these other more secular spiritualities together. We also have gender spirituality. Many, many others still emerging every day in our pluralistic online world. Today, we seem to be utterly fascinated with all aspects of spirituality. Let's focus now on styles of Christian spirituality. And I just want to say they are abundant. Christian spirituality is a virtual smorgasbord of choices. Resonance with one or another really depends on the individual person and I dare say your personality or your lifestyle. But please know that there is no one right way to express your spirituality. The most important thing to think about is growth in intimacy with God. Now historically, spirituality in the Christian mode has been expressed in many ways from martyrdom in the first century to monastic practices in the Middle Ages and to the many, many variations of the modern era. During Vatican II, a big shift happened in terms of spirituality. The documents of Vatican II talk about the universal call to holiness. What did they mean? Basically, prior to that, if a person was really enamored with God and wanted to be on a spiritual journey, that meant they probably had a vocation either to the priesthood or to religious life. And everyone else, all of us lay people who didn't have vocations, who got married and had kids, were just sort of garden variety Christians. We weren't expected to go on a deep spiritual journey. But Vatican II changed all of that and called us all to holiness and said that if we were enamored with God and had a need to let Christianity really permeate into our lives, that it didn't mean we had to be a priest or a nun. It simply meant that we were struggling to be human. And so ever since Vatican II in the 60s, we have been developing a Christian spirituality that is for everyone. Before I talk about the nitty gritty of the personal spiritual journey, I want to point out to you some famous Christian spiritualities. I begin with Benedictine spirituality, and if I had to characterize it, I'd say that it is reverence for the ordinary. Founded by St. Benedict in the 6th century, it quickly spread throughout Europe. St. Benedict founded a monastery for people who really wanted to make their spiritual lives everything. And so at this monastery, they entered into a very kind of austere way of life. They wanted to make the here and now right and holy. And according to the rule of St. Benedict that he wrote out for anyone who wanted this way of life, there are tools that can be used, ordinary tools, that would serve as sacred 
altar vessels, if you will, for all of us. For example, a spatula would be the tool for the spiritual life of someone who is a cook, a shovel for a gardener, and today, I dare say in our modern world, our computers are sacred altar vessels for all of us. St. Benedict insisted on a balance of prayer and study and work. And he said that these three brought together would nourish the spiritual self, would open up a space, an inner place that was free and open. He grounded it in four anchors. The rule, again, this is the book that he wrote outlining all of the ways that his Benedictine followers were going to uh, live. The gospel, of course, the wisdom of the community, and look at this, particular circumstances of a person's life. Everything that happens to you, he said, was all about making the here and now right and holy. Prayer, of course, is a regular part of the rhythm of life, and he asked his followers to enter into it all hours of the day using Liturgy of the Hours. But the preferential form of prayer then would be Liturgy, reading the Psalms, and singing hymns. Let them prefer nothing whatever to Christ, is a famous quote written in all of the Benedictine literature. So if you have reverence for the ordinary and you like what you're hearing, you can go online and read the rule of St. Benedict. There are many, many people who still follow his way of life, not only in monasteries, but just ordinary people like you and I that want to integrate his way of looking at life as full of the divine. I turn now to Carmelite spirituality. And if I had to characterize it, I'd say that they focus on the depths of silence and experience. The origin of Carmelite spirituality begins with the hermits who lived on Mount Carmel. These were men and women who decided to leave the hustle and bustle of the city and go out and spend their whole lives devoted to prayer in solitude and alone. Mount Carmel was considered the home of the prophet Elijah from the Old Testament. And Carmelites often talk about the embrace of desert spirituality which is a combination of solitude and community. They wanted the inner life to reflect a stark interior landscape where nothing else mattered except God. Some of the founders of Carmelite spirituality are Saint Albert, but most of the time you hear about Carmelite spirituality from those who practiced it like St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, who evolved this Carmelite spirituality during and after the Crusades. A Carmelite's emphasis is on contemplative prayer. Remember when I talked about prayer? This is the form of prayer that you are ridding yourself of all images and simply resting or dwelling in this deep, intimate relationship with God. For them, it's a profound love that comes out of silence. They talk about the fact that if you take away all distractions and all words and you simply sit in silence, eventually what you experience is this intimate bond of love between you and God. And that love then directs everything that you do in your outer life. So transformation is really about becoming a mystic, one who knows God, not in their head by intellectual means, 
but by experience. It's not anything weird or spooky. Sometimes when you hear the word mystical, that's what you think. It's anything but. To them, mystical is very ordinary and very grounded and very simple. To a Carmelite, life is meant to be enjoyed, embraced, celebrated, both in solitude and in communal living. And these mystical experiences of love that they have in contemplation lead them to service of other people with joy. Like St. Benedict, they combine work, study, and prayer and insist upon a balance of it. Father William McNamara says that a Carmelite's contemplative prayer is simply taking a long, loving look at the real. And you notice, real is capitalized. And so therefore, it's about taking a long, loving look at the divine. I turn now to Franciscan spirituality, and this is one that perhaps you know more about because St. Francis is one of the most recognized and beloved saints in all the world. Underlying Franciscan spirituality is a love of creation. And I think especially children resonate with St. Francis. Look at this picture of him holding a bird and there's all kinds of animals around him. Sometimes he's shown with the wolf of Gubbio, which is a very fun story about St. Francis. But anyway, he lived in the 12th and 13th centuries. And St. Francis was a person who lived a very ascetic lifestyle. Although he came from a wealthy family, he rejected all of the wealth after he had this profound spiritual experience. He put on a coarse robe that turned quickly to rags because he held no, nothing in possession. He begged for his food. He lived outside and he was one of the most joyful troubadours of the great king, as they called him. He went about preaching and singing and dancing and pointing out to people the love that was permeating through creation. To a Franciscan, the whole world is a tabernacle. That means that the whole world is shining with the real presence of Christ. To them, beauty is the door to the sacred, and God is best encountered in the beauty of creation. But lest you think that this spirituality is easy or simple or you just want to jump right into it, if you are going to follow Franciscan spirituality, it's tough because it's all about simplicity of form and simplicity of heart. St. Francis was in love with Lady Poverty. This is not a person. It is a non-attachment to material possessions. Franciscans are more involved with owning nothing or being attached to nothing and putting God at the center. They also conform to the image of Christ crucified. St. Francis bore the stigmata, the wounds of Christ at the end of his life. He desired so much to be identified with Christ crucified. That's not an easy thing to do. And yet for Francis to have nothing but Christ brought joy to the human heart. So this joy then would spill over into the love of other people, the love of life, the love of all things created. If you were to follow St. Francis, some prayer forms for you might include working outside, admiring the light on the ocean, enjoying a party, singing and dancing and laughing at life. But it is also the prayer of silence again, like the Carmelite, a mystical, intimate love emerging from nothing. Proclaim the gospel always. Use words only if necessary. 
This is a quote attributed to St. Francis and something that I think we all should think about. Thomistic spirituality, based on the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, a 13th century Dominican, is characterized by intellectual vigor. To St. Thomas Aquinas, to know God was to love God. And so the more that you use your intellect to reason forth and to philosophize about God, the closer you're going to get to God. For those of you who have more of an intellectual ascent in, in your spirituality, you, you like to read, you like to find proof, you like to look at all kinds of different arguments and different explanations, Thomistic spirituality might resonate really well with you. St. Thomas was very interested in taking the Aristotelian proofs for the existence of God and expanding their, his categories to all of theology. Thomistic spirituality says that moral behavior follows intellectual understanding and knowledge. In other words, we have a reason then to, to keep a moral life, to live a moral life, if we understand it. St. Thomas also talked about the fact that the mind had to be fed for faith to flourish. And prayer in the Thomistic style was grounded in Lexio Divina, something I've talked about a lot, using the scriptures and other inspiring readings as the springboard for prayer. I want to pause here for a moment and just point out to you that these spiritualities are overlapping. They all have at the heart of them this love for God that creates a bond and gives meaning to life. So it doesn't mean that St. Francis did not have intellectual vigor. He did. No, nor does it mean that St. Benedict did not love creation because he did. All of them are interwoven with one another, focusing on one particular aspect and on different personalities that emerge. And isn't it interesting to look at this in terms of who God is? All of them make up the face of God, all these spiritualities. And all of them have a lot to teach us about how to live. The last famous Christian spirituality that I'll talk about here is Ignatian spirituality, also known as Jesuit spirituality. And to the Jesuits, underlying everything is their stand for justice. Founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola in the 16th century, they focus in on finding God in all things. There's another expression, God in all things, all things in God. They taught that our deep desires are healthy and that they will lead us towards God because we long for this intimate union and we know somehow that God wants what's best for us. So the task of life for a Jesuit is to align themselves on a path toward God. St. Ignatius wrote what are called the spiritual exercises, including the examen, which I've mentioned before when we were talking about first reconciliation. These spiritual exercises, he said, would help us to see where God is active in our lives. And I think it's really interesting that the application here is to look at life in terms of consolations and desolations. So in these spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius looks at what we can repeat the consolations that come to us every single day. But he also doesn't want us to turn our backs on the things that we can 
avoid the things that tempt us. And this is what he calls desolations. And so every single day you would look at these two different things in your prayer at night and try to implement them. The spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius can be done today by anyone. But I'm going to warn you, if you go on an Ignatian retreat, these exercises will take you 30 days. You'll have to leave your life for a month and immerse yourselves totally in all of the ways he has you look at your spiritual life. Some people can do these, uh, you know, in their daily lives as well. And there are many applications of the spiritual exercises. So again, here's an opportunity to go online and look them up and just take a look at all of the things that Ignatius taught. He emphasized humility, simplicity, and service. The Jesuits have a heart for the poor, for the marginalized, the lost, and separated. To them, the call of Christ is to lift up the lowly, to put into practice this preferential option for the poor that comes to us through Jesus and the Gospels. Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And it's interesting, isn't it, that he took the name Francis following the rule of St. Francis, but he's also a Jesuit. And if you read Pope Francis carefully, you'll see both spiritualities coming out of his writings. The Jesuits are also known for teaching and for their emphasis on intellectual pursuits, which makes them in line again with Thomistic spirituality. See how they overlap. Some of the most uh, or the greatest Catholic institutions today are formed by the Jesuits. And so Jesuit spirituality is at the very heart, especially of many of our teachings and our ways of life when we talk about service. There are many other monastic spiritualities. Here's just a few of them. Augustinian, following the teachings of St. Augustine, Dominican after St. Dominic, Pauline after St. Paul, Norbertine, Marist, Cistercian, Trappist, Servite, on and on and on they go. So just remember when you hear any of these names given to particular orders or that they represent uh, different forms of spirituality and that they are all connected in some way. So you're just an average person, a lay person like me. How can we foster our spirituality? Do any of the mainline Christian spiritualities resonate with you? What is right for you? I would like you to start thinking about directing your spirituality in one way or another, but how do you do that? Here's some things to consider. First of all, think about your own personality. What do you find that you gravitate toward? Outdoor hikes and nature? Or do you like to read and, you know, your, your happy place is the library? Um, anyway, think about your personality. Are you an extrovert, an introvert? All of the things that seem to, you seem to know about yourself, your self-awareness. Look at your gifts, your charisms. I'd also suggest that you read more about spirituality. I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg here. You need to know a little bit more about all these different kinds and possibly how you could combine some of them. And then spend some time in discernment. Try on some forms. Try contemplative prayer like a Carmelite. Try meditative prayer with Ignatius. Which one resonates with you? I'm warning you, not everything will fit, and it's okay to blend them and design your own spirituality. Just continue to realize that it has to be something that you can do for the long haul, not just for now. 
So even though you might want to go on a 30-day Ignatian retreat and leave everything behind, you can't do that every day. And so that can't really fit for you. You have to maybe write your own rule for your own life. I did that many years ago, and I found it very difficult, but also very rewarding. And pretty much every year I revisit my rule and I reshape it based on what's going on in my life right now. In 2005, I became a certified spiritual director after three years of study. What is a spiritual director? Well, a spiritual director is a companion, is someone that has been trained to listen with you to your life and point out various ways that God may be trying to speak to you. Directors don't give you advice. Directors simply listen and try to illuminate what is probably obvious to them and not to you. And so I'm going to give you some advice after many years of listening to people, of going to spiritual direction myself, to try to help you uh, grow in your own spirituality. So I'm calling this good advice. I hope it is. I'm going to tell you it's not just my advice. It's what I've learned from experience and from other spiritual directors as well. So my first piece of advice is to practice one tradition, but understand many. There's an expression that in spiritual circles, it's best to stay in your own lane. And especially now when you have just newly converted to Catholicism, you've chosen Christianity as your driving force. So dedicate the rest of your life to steeping yourself in that tradition rather than being lured into, let, let me try Buddhism now, let me try Hinduism, let me try Judaism. Well, I love the fact that we can read about all of those world religions. There's simply not time to become steeped in all of them. To know one tradition, just to know Christianity, will take you a lifetime. And even then, the more you study it, the more there is. And so there are over 200 masters of spirituality in the Christian tradition. Masters, these are people that have spent their whole lives on it. And so my advice then, you've chosen Christianity, really try hard the rest of your life to immerse yourself in it. Most of the world religions have underlying connecting themes. I like to think of it like these spiritualities, these religions are like planets revolving around the sun. <laughs> and you can't live on all the planets. You can only live on one of them. All of them are revolving around God. All of them are going to teach you a lot about spirituality and about God. But focus in on the one that you have been called to. And right now, you know that has been Christianity. Another piece of advice is to spend time getting to know yourself. That might sound kind of psychological to you, kind of self-absorbed, but spiritual directors have taught me that to know God, you have to know yourself. God dwells within each of us, and we cannot understand anything about the divine unless we understand the divine imprint within. So use all those personality inventories that you've undoubtedly encountered in your life, like Myers-Briggs, emotional intelligence, and here's another word, the Enneagram, if you've never heard what it is. It is a tool for spiritual growth that was first introduced by the Jesuits. So that's another thing you can look up 
I, and I could help you with if you ever want to dabble into that. Besides personality inventories, also consider your family of origin, your birth order, your relationships, your style of parenting, both the parenting that was given to you and if you are a parent, how you parent your children. Family of origin has a lot to do with how we view God. Simple awareness of life. You know, on the retreat when we took the rock walk, I was trying to get you to see that if you slow down and you get out of the egocentric predicament, there is a lot of information coming through to us about God if we're simply attentive to it. And look at your thought patterns, because thoughts really do matter. And so many thoughts just bombard us every single day. But learning to watch them and control what we are thinking will bring us to a greater awareness of God's presence among us. Those are just some of the things. In spiritual direction, you spend a lot of time talking about yourself and learning to see the temptations, the pitfalls, and also the positive aspects of who you are and how they relate to God. Another piece of advice, use as many tools as you can to develop your spirituality. Obviously, prayer is up there at the top of the list. This is simply communicating with God every day, scheduling a rendezvous. I call it a rendezvous. I love that word. A rendezvous with God where you're putting aside either 15, 20 minutes a day just to dwell in God's presence, listening at prayer, talking to God. I also recommend journaling, a spiritual journal. This isn't a journal where you're talking about what you ate for breakfast and what happened when you took the kids to church or what happened at, at work, so forth. This is a journal about spiritual happenings in your life. You know, there are times when you have thoughts, when you have epiphanies, when you have sudden awarenesses of God's presence, and you wonder, where did that come from? I would write those down every day in a journal, and I have been doing this for many years, and use it as a pathway to spiritual growth. So those journals I gave you at the retreat, get it out. If you haven't written in it since the retreat, maybe now's the time to start. Every single day, it can be just a sentence, it can be a word, it can be a sketch of something, or it can be a you know 10-page diatribe about something that's going on in your life. But make it a priority. You're not going to get anything out of journaling if you only do it once every six months. You need to begin to journal every day or at least several times a week and then go back into your journal and see if God is trying to tell you something. Spiritual reading, both the scriptures and other enlightening texts, are just so valuable. I always have a spiritual book going of some kind. And believe me, I've reread a lot of old books that I had read, you know, years and years ago. So I love to read and I and I read novels too every day. But besides reading novels for pleasure and also for spirituality, I keep a spiritual book going all the time. If you don't know what books to read, I will give you a reading list. Just ask me. I have many, many recommendations. The other tool, and, and we don't often think of this as a tool, but it is to have conversations with spiritual friends and guides. Do not go alone on this journey of spirituality. It helps so much to be able to talk to someone about the subtleties of the spiritual life because, believe me, 
many aspects of spirituality are very subtle. When I started out on my intentional spiritual journey in my early 30s, I had no one to talk to. I was very confused about what God was calling me to. I suddenly felt very misunderstood. I felt very separate from people. And I knew I needed someone to talk to. But it wasn't that easy to find someone. And I will say to you that the deeper you get and the more serious you get about the spiritual journey, you're going to find that there are fewer and fewer people who know what you're talking about. And that's unfortunate. We desperately need guides. We need friends who have been on the journey longer than us. We need elders with wisdom about God. And just because somebody's old doesn't mean they're wise. I will say that too. There are lots and lots of people my age and, and older that have been lifelong Catholics, but they don't really know their faith. They don't they won't be able to give you the answers that you need. So you need to find someone that you can trust, someone you know is committed and has been doing this longer than you and deeper than you have. And so look for them. You'll find out pretty quickly who can go deep with you and who cannot. Daily connections with friends and guys, daily connections with God, daily connections in community are also very important if you're going to grow spiritually. The last bullet point says, see online resources for spiritual growth. I will give you that handout. I have some written down for you. Not everything online is good, <laughs> need I say. And so I would like you to really get a curated list. Don't believe everything you read online about Catholicism or spirituality. You have to really sink into it deeply and look at all aspects of it before you really decide what's going to resonate and what isn't. But definitely use the tools out there, and there are many. Humility. This is a very piece of important advice. Always, 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 we have to put on beginner's mind about God. No matter how much we think we know, every day, every single day, I try to put on beginner's mind. Gosh, there's just so much. I have been immersed in this for four decades, and yet I am so humbled by the process. Humility is truth, not self-deprecation. I don't say this to make you think I feel less of myself. No, the spiritual journey has taught me. The truth is that we are all beginners. It's a grounding of the self in that reality so that I don't set myself up ever on a pedestal or as a master teacher or as someone who is more enlightened than anyone else. When it comes to God, I allow God alone to be the big reality for me. And this always brings me to my knees. Discernment is a huge part of the spiritual life. Discernment is simply a deep reflection, often with a wisdom elder, about life's decisions. Spirituality is all about aligning your will with the will of God. 
And that is very difficult. We need discernment. We need a time to really think about where God is calling us and if this is God's voice or the false self directing us. And so we focus on trying to make our own wills align with the will of God by allowing this false self or this ego or the shadow to die and then allowing the true self hidden in Christ within us, Christ consciousness to emerge. Now that probably sounds like just a lot of words to you. And that's why discernment is so important to do with a wisdom elder, someone who can help you walk through that. If you want a deep spiritual life, and believe me, all of this is worth it. These are the things that are most important in growth and ongoing relationship. In the end, you could probably say to yourself, well, why should I focus on the spiritual journey? It sounds like a lot of work. Well, it really is. It is a lot of work. But to me, it comes down to one or two simple questions. Do I want to end up a sorrowful and bitter old person? Or do I want to end up joyful and wise when I'm old? Which one will it be? Without the, the deep spiritual life, every one of us will be pulled into that bitter old person. And I'm sure you know a lot of those people in your life. But the spiritual life will bring us deep down joy. And that, to me, is more important at the end of my life than anything else. When I talk about joy, it's not about happiness. It's about that luminous, brilliant, underlying light that ultimately will happen if God is at the center of our lives. With a spiritual director, with the companionship that we get from that, we know that the journey is not only important, but all of the work that we put into it is worth it. When I look back on my life right now and the four decades I've spent, <laughs> all the work I've done, I don't regret one moment of it. I have other regrets, other things that I've done that I wish I hadn't, but taking the spiritual journey serious has been, was the best decision of my whole life. I'm going to end there, um, but I did give you a handout with the Sunday packet I gave you. And inside of it, there is uh, a little diagram that looks like this, uh, the inner compass. And I'd ask you to spend some time this week and just think about what spirituality might fit for you. There are some directions on that handout, but think of the very, very innermost circle as your true self hidden in Christ. And the concentric circles or the, the compass points then would help you sort of get to that inner compass, would help that true self that that lies hidden to be more revealed to the world. When we talk about dying to self, and Christ talked about this too, emptying himself, and all the images of the Paschal mystery about death and resurrection, this also has to do with us. We're not talking about our whole personality dying or our, our bodies dying, nothing morbid like that. It has more to do with letting the ego or the shadow or those parts of ourselves that are keeping us blocked from this Christ consciousness, allowing them to die. 
And these compass points can help us in that quest. And so spend some time this week and read the handouts and maybe do the little exercise so that we can talk about what spirituality fits for you when we come back together on Sunday. And so until then, know you are always with me.